Tonight, we welcome Dean Pyers with the Steam Railroading, Railroading Institute of Owasso to talk about how one of Michigan's historic trains served as the inspiration for the train featured in the movie, The Polar Express. He will cover the history of the locomotive, a bit about railroads in Michigan, his and his involvement with the Polar Express, and more. Please give a warm RHPL welcome to Dean Pyers. Good evening. Uh, thanks for inviting uh, the Steam Learning Institute to speak this evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and thanks to uh, Mike and Pat Dobozenski who helped arrange this with Amanda here at the uh, library. Uh, I give Amanda a lot of credit. I do probably two or three of these presentations a year. And I think this is the first one where people I know outside of work or outside of uh, the Institute were texting me or emailing me saying, are you giving a talk on a Tuesday night in Rochester? What, what's going on? So she did a fine job of advertising here in Hennepin Town. So we appreciate that. Um, I'm a volunteer at the Steam Learning Institute. Any other, any other members of our group that uh, I don't see here in the audience? So, yeah, uh, in normal life, I work uh, for General Motors as an engineer. So everybody you see in the photographs or most of the people that you see here are volunteers. We have a few paid staff uh, at the Institute. But we take care of and operate Pear Marquette 1225. And we'll talk a little bit about the history of, the, of that particular steam locomotive and our involvement uh, in the past uh, 10, uh, 13 years with the Polar Express movie and how uh, our locomotive became the model for uh, the movie. Uh, well, I'll give you a brief overview of what we do at the museum in Owasso. Uh, a short a little history about railroads in Michigan and the impact that it had on our state in this area and the, the Great Lakes region. A little bit of history about railroads here in Rochester, in you know, the Rochester Hills. And then we'll get into the history of the Paramarquette 1225 and the group that has restored and operated it operates it. Our mission statement at uh, the Steam Learning Institute, and for those of you who aren't familiar with where Owasso is located, it's between uh, Flint and Lansing. It's about 20 miles due west of Flint on M21. And our mission statement is to educate the public about steam air technology, railroad technology, and the impact it had on the culture and economy of the Great Lakes region. We do that by safely operating. We do operate the locomotive uh, to uh, now, uh, preserving it and exhibiting and interpreting other historic railroad equipment. Uh, we sit on about seven acres. Owasso is a former uh, backshop town of the Ann Arbor Railroad. Uh, the Ann Arbor line went from Toledo up through Ann Arbor, naturally, uh, through Owasso and then up into Mount Pleasant, Clare, and Cadillac, kind of cut uh, uh, southeast and northwest across the state of Michigan. And uh, our museum and visitor center sit on the property that was once all railroad yard. Uh, it's still an active freight line. The Great Lakes Central Railroad is our host railroad. We have a, a great relationship with them. They do a wonderful job for us and allow us to run our excursion trips and, and, and uh, holiday uh, trips. And during the week, they're hauling freight through those, through those cities, through those towns of, of mid-Michigan. Um, our visitor center is a former uh, a warehouse, a, a granary and dairy building uh, that was in Owasso. So we have a small museum there. And then, like I said, everybody you see in the photographs that is in either maintenance clothes or car hose clothes, we're all volunteers. We have four paid staff members, uh, executive director, uh, chief mechanic, uh, an assistant mechanic and a couple people in the office. And other than that, everybody you interact with, if you came up to visit us, is a volunteer. So, so keep that in mind while you're asking me questions tonight. Right? <laughs> uh, there are lots of different chores and tasks. Not all of us are machinists or professional uh, railroaders. So we come from the auto industry, from school teaching, uh, uh, insurance, a uh, variety of different fields uh, that we uh, volunteer. Uh, for and so there are different jobs and we hope that when people come uh, we're giving some magical memories in the last a lifetime. Everybody say oh. all. <laughs> Even though those kids that we use in that photo are probably in college right now. 
A um, little history on the impact the railroads had. I did a presentation a few uh, a few months ago in Northville, and I use this as an example because it would have been similar if we were in Rochester or every town. But they had a great history, and they had a, a great a book that, uh, about local Northville history. Um, and in 1815, they quoted the Surveyor General of the United States, a man named Edward Tiffin, as saying that in the entire Michigan Peninsula, you might be able to find an acre out of a hundred or maybe a thousand that was worth something. Everything else was swamp land and, and just horrible land. Uh, now, Edward Tiffin later became the governor of Ohio, so maybe he was you know, starting that whole Ohio State Michigan feud at the time. But in reality, we were a little swampy and, and there's some back, a little backward country up here. Uh, in 1837, your Michigan became a state. If you were in the Northville area and wanted to travel 19 miles to Detroit, it would take you about three days, according to the history that Northville uh, wrote. Uh, you'd have to take a, it was a 30-mile route to get around the swamps and the bogs and whatnot. <laughs> uh, by 1869, 1870, you now railroads are starting to come to Michigan. They're starting to be built, and towns would petition or, or start campaigns and investment campaigns to try to encourage railroads to come to their town. And that, in fact, happened then in uh, Northville, the Holly Wayne Monroe Railroad began the construction through those uh, three towns from north to south. Or, uh, from, they started in, in Wayne, moving north actually, from, from, from uh, south to north. And the first train arrived in Northville in May, May 27, 1871, to much fanfare. A gala day, uh, general rejoicing. Uh, they planned a big party, a huge chicken dinner, which they did uh, have about six hours late. They planned it for lunchtime. The railroad crew didn't make it into town until that evening. But they got the band back together and marched up to the town hotel and fed everyone. And in my favorite quote of all the historical research I've ever worked on, contrary to popular opinion, the evening passed quietly because the railroad workers just sang a few songs and didn't cause any trouble. So we want your railroad to come to town, but then get out as fast as you can. You know, they, they were afraid that they were going to terrorize the village, which apparently they did not. So um, I like using this map. Uh, we should all recognize it as this, our state, uh, our fair state, the Lower Peninsula. What are the lines, when you see all the lines on the map, what do you, what do you, what do you see? What are those? What are the lines? Somebody's cheating. So, yeah, okay, you're supposed to say roads. When we look at it today, we would see highway systems. We'd see I-75 cutting up to the center of the state. Oops, that was the wrong button. Uh, up, to the, up to the middle of the state. Uh, US-94 going over through Jackson and down into Chicago, I-96 up to Grand Rapids. This map is actually from 1912 or 1913, and it was a railroad map. If our great-grandparents looked at that map, they would also recognize Michigan. They'd recognize all those lines, but rather than calling them highways, they would be able to name the railroad lines that they were. By and large, the modern highway system pretty much follows those old uh, old railroad lines. Uh, here in Rochester, uh, also about in the 1871-1872 time frame, the railroad started to arrive here in Rochester. You had a couple of lines that joined here. Uh, the Detroit and Bay City Railroad, uh, linking those two cities, came through uh, in October of 1872. We can assume that there was you know, general uh, uh, happiness and joy that that had happened uh, here in town. That line, the north-south line through town, became part of the New York Central, uh, or part of the Michigan Central Railroad, and later the New York Central system. Uh, the Penn Central abandoned that route in uh, March of 1976, and it was later converted to a trail, Pink Creek Trail, which I'll talk about at the end of the presentation. You also had passing through town here, uh, Grand Trunk Western Line uh, between Pontiac and Richmond. So there was an east-west line and a north-south line, which was very important. That was a big deal to be able to go all four directions at any given time from a single location. So 
Uh, it would bring prosperity. We had you know, the woolen mill, which was shipping uh, uh, gloves and, and shirts and, and clothing by that point, as well as all the agricultural, pro various agricultural products would have gone out by rail in those days. We also had an interurban line. The interurban system was an electrified uh, line. It was a uh, standard gauge, but uh, considered somewhat more like a streetcar or a trolley car. Uh, they were very popular in the early part of the century for about the first 20, 30 years of the 1900s. Um, uh, mostly all gone by the 1930s. A few lasted into the 1950s. But the line through uh, Rochester connected uh, with Royal Oak and Flint. And then there was a branch line off uh, towards um, uh, Romeo and, and Lapeer. Uh, one thing I should mention, if, if you're interested in, in more details, if you've ever visited the website michiganrailroads.com, uh, it's a wonderful resource for railroad history here in Michigan. They have uh, literally thousands of images scanned. It's a fabulous website. If you want to dig deeper into railroad-related history events or things that happen here in the state, where could you go if you were living in Rochester uh, roughly 60 years ago? Let's say uh, as late as 1959, the New York Central still ran uh, two trains a day each direction. So there were four trains a day that stopped every day in Rochester. One between Detroit and Bay City, one between Detroit and Mackinac City, an overnight run that would uh, leave the endpoints at night and pass during the night. And then on the weekend, there was an extra train. On Friday night, the Timberliner would leave uh, the Michigan Central Depot downtown to take uh, auto executives or, or people from uh, the, the city uh, up north for the weekend. So it would leave on Friday night and come back on Sunday night. And those trains all stopped in Rochester. So you have four to six trains passing through a day uh, as late as 1959. Uh, the last runs were in 1963 and 1964. By um, March of 1964, there was no longer any passenger service stopping here in Rochester. Uh, the freight service lasted another 12 years until the Penn Central. Uh, our locomotive, as I said earlier, uh, was owned by the Pere Marquette Railway Company. So a little brief overview of what the Pere Marquette was. Uh, the Pere Marquette was a conglomeration of several other smaller roads. Um, just like airlines and car companies merge together and become bigger uh, you know, nowadays in our modern times, so did the railroads back in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s. They'd start out building a line between a couple of cities. They'd join or be acquired by the line adjacent to them. And then pretty soon you had bigger networks or bigger <laughs> systems being built. And such was the case with the Per Marquette Railway. Uh, January 1st, 1900, uh, the Flint and Per Marquette, which was built to connect two rivers, uh, the Flint River over in Flint and Ludington, Michigan, the Per Marquette River in Ludington. Uh, joined with the Detroit Grand Rapids and Western, which went on into Chicago, and the Chicago and West Michigan, which also went up the west side of the state. Chicago and West Michigan had become relatively wealthy hauling Michigan white pine or lumber into the city of Chicago after the fire, after the Great Fire. They helped rebuild uh, the city by hauling uh, our timber from the Lake Michigan shore over into <coughs> Chicago. Then naturally, as manufacturing grew, uh, the railroad grew right along with it and hauled manufacturing goods, automobiles, steel, all the different parts and components. Um, for about 48 years, they were eventually merged into the Chesapeake and Ohio system. So if any of you remember any of the lines around uh, the area that were CNO, they were probably originally from Marquette. And now, uh, today, they're still operated by the CSX group. Bankruptcy and receivership happened many, many times. The history of railroads in Michigan is one of growth and then uh, you know, bankruptcy and despair. Railroads make their money by hauling freight long distances. Uh, what do we run into if we go 200 miles in almost any direction in Michigan? Water, we run into water. So it's hard to get a long haul or at a peninsula. 
Uh, it's a lot of effort to get across the lake, although the Michigan railroads did make the best of it. Um, as early as 1890, it was a real nuisance to get through Chicago. Freight trains would go in and just never come out. It took three weeks to get freight through. It was a big hassle. So the Michigan line said, we'll, we'll, invest, we'll, we'll invent some car ferries. We'll advertise to all those manufacturers in the east, in New York and Massachusetts. Hey, you can shortcut Chicago. Give it to us. Give the freight to us. We'll float it across Lake Michigan and connect with one of the western railroads, and you can head on up into the Pacific Northwest or, or Minnesota or wherever you were heading. And they were pretty successful at that. That, that lasted about 90 years, up to about 1980, when the, the last uh, of the Lake Michigan Railroad ferries uh, operated. Premarquette operated out of Ludington. The Ann Arbor operated up here in uh, the Frankfurt, Alberta area. And then the Grand Trunk was in Muskegon, Grand Haven in Muskegon. Our particular locomotive, a little history of what is the Paramount Cap 1225. It is the number that is always carried, that number. Um, these were known as the 1200 series engines uh, for the Paramount Cap. Uh, they numbered them sequentially. There were 39 of them. And 1225 was delivered to the railroad in November of 1941. It was built by the Lima Locomotive Works in Lima, Ohio. Lima was sort of the, there was a big three back then of locomotive builders, Baldwin, American Locomotive, and Lima. They were sort of the smallest of the big three, but they were known for being fairly inventive and creative and doing a lot with superpower. They put a lot of technology into their engines to get the most power that they could out of a gallon of water or a ton of coal. And uh, the original cost of the locomotive is a quarter of a million dollars or roughly two and a half million dollars in today's money. Not unlike what a locomotive or the diesel locomotive would cost today. It was known as a Berkshire type locomotive. Uh, locomotives all had class names and they had you know, sort of like a nickname. This, uh, this wheel arrangement uh, they, were, they were known by their wheel arrangements. In our case, it's a 284, meaning there's two pilot wheels that help guide the locomotive into, a, into curves and through switches, eight driving wheels that do the work, that's where all the rods that you see the, are moving and doing the, the pulling work, and then uh, four wheels back at the underneath the cab and supporting the weight of the firebox in the cab. And those, that class of engine, as it was built by Lyman demonstrated, it was first tested up in the Berkshire Mountains by the Boston and Albany Railroad. And they found that one locomotive could do the work of two locomotives, or two locomotives and a helper. Or they could pull longer trains across the Berkshire. It conquered the Berkshire Mountains, and so it became the nickname it got was a Berkshire-type locomotive. And it was first introduced by Lyman in 1925, very successful. And there was a group of railroads that were all loosely affiliated with uh, the Van Swergen brothers in Cleveland, uh, who owned shares or a majority of the Paramarquette in Chesapeake, Ohio, and several other railroads here in the east or here in the east uh, half of the country. Uh, and they got their mechanical people together to come up with a common design. And that was one of the first times all the railroads had sort of worked together to do some standardization. The Van Swergen family is kind of interesting if you're interested in history. Uh, there's not a lot of books written about them. But they were two brothers. They were uh, real estate investors. They were not railroad magnets by, by trade. Uh, they invented places such as Shaker Heights, Ohio, uh, a suburb uh, with a lot of uh, uh, very, very uh, orderly planned community. And uh, they decided that their various suburbs could use a railroad connection into downtown. And rather than just rent or lease or make an arrangement with an existing railroad, they bought most of the nickel plate. And they found that they made a lot of money with that, so they started buying up other railroads. At one point, their fortune was estimated, in today's term, of about $3 billion they, they controlled. Unfortunately, a lot of that was leveraged, and when the Great Depression hit, uh, they went bankrupt fairly quickly. Uh, both brothers died within a year of each other in the 1930s and were worth 
what I've read, about $3,000 plus a home, plus a, a mansion that they own. But, uh, from incredible wealth to back to the, the poverty that they came from. Uh, an interesting story, but rather reclusive. They, they, they didn't give very many interviews, and, and not a whole lot's been written about them. It would be interesting uh, folks to, uh, to research. Uh, so, some technical specs about Pear Marquette 1225. If you came up to see us, you would see uh, about a 400 ton locomotive when we we're fully loaded. We carry 22 tons of coal, 22,000 gallons of water, uh, weighs uh, 440 tons in total, uh, stands about 110 feet in length, 16 uh, feet high. Uh, the driving wheels, those, those drivers, the, in this photograph, the, uh, the, the white wall tires there, uh, don't get us started about that subject. Uh, that's a whole other story. Uh, but that was the way they were delivered oftentimes. Uh, and those stand 69 inches high, so 5 feet 9, which is just about the same height I am. Uh, the great area of the firebox is 90 square feet, so it's a 9 by 10 room where we uh, burn the coal. We are still coal fired. We are still a coal operated locomotive. And uh, operating maximum pressure on the boiler is 245 pounds. Or maximum operating pressure is 245 pounds. There are safety devices that lift. I mean, it's difficult to keep a perfect balance on steam pressure. And so if you cross 245 pounds, there are various safety devices that will relieve the excess pressure and then you'll bring it back down. Uh, our fuel consumption is about one ton of coal every 12 to 15 miles if we have a full load. And we go through 150 gallons of water uh, every mile. I'll let you convert that into miles per gallon uh, or however else you would like to uh, review the fuel efficiency. And we generate 3,000 horsepower, which is also roughly the same as a modern diesel locomotive. The earlier diesels had less horsepower, but they could link several of them together to match the pulling power of one uh, Berkshire type locomotive or other. Uh, uh, similar freight engines. Um, uh, the history of the locomotive, uh, as I said, it was delivered in November of 1941. It operated for the railroad, it operated for the Pair Marquette for about 10 years, 1941 to 1951. Uh, traveled about 50,000 miles a year, roughly. Um, maybe 200 miles in a working day, 200 miles a, a, a day, uh, 250 day, days in, in a year. Uh, the railroad pretty quickly after World War II started to dieselize. They were a lot less labor intensive, they were more efficient, and so the steam power through the 1950s started to uh, fade away pretty rapidly. And the Pair Marquette was complete with that by the end of 1951. They, they did it pretty fast up here in Michigan. And so the railroad had a lot of extra steam locomotives, but they couldn't cut them up right away. There were loans and they were collateral for different loans, so they had to store them. And there's also a thought that maybe they were storing some just-in-case locomotives, you know, if this whole diesel thing didn't work out, or uh, maybe if there was a big upsurge in traffic that they needed some extra power. So they stored them over on the west side of the state, various railroad yards, over in Grand Rapids, Holland area. And she sat there along with her 39 other locomotives, uh, minus a couple that went to other railroads, uh, for about six years when a retired Dodge executive named Forrest Akers. Any MSU Spartans out here in the audience? Uh, we have one. Have you heard the name Forrest Akers? Probably you think you have, yes. A few buildings and golf courses and things named for him. Well, he was a trustee at MSU, and uh, he was, on, or he was uh, on, on the board of the university, and was interested in railroading, and decided it would be a nice idea if some of these locomotives were preserved. So he called his friend, the president of MSU, up. Well, first he called his friend at the Chesapeake in Ohio, a man named uh, Cyrus Eaton, and said, shouldn't we donate a few of these for posterity because the steam era is ending? He thought that was a good idea. So Forrest Akers called up the president of the university and said, I have a great deal for you. I am going to give you a steam locomotive for display. 
The way he suppose the president of the university said to one of his largest donors and benefactors at that point, sure, I'd just love to have a steam locomotive. <laughs> Didn't know exactly what he was going to do with it. The, president, the dean of the engineering college wasn't interested. The dean of the engineering college said, our students are learning electronics and space flight. What, 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 what can a steam locomotive teach us? But the museum took it, and it sat on display up near Spartan Stadium on the spur near the old power plant uh, for many for several years after that. So if you attended a, a Michigan State football game between 1957 and roughly 1982, I think it was, and you remember seeing a steam locomotive on site, this was the locomotive. Um, there was then a group uh, the students, actually, that formed in the 1969-1970 school year, a group of students got together to take care of the locomotive and open it up more frequently for tours and just generally restore it. And uh, a couple of those members decided, wouldn't it, shouldn't we try to restore it? Wouldn't it be fun to restore the locomotive? There was some steam preservation going on in those days. And they thought they'd call football specials, the football fan trips to Columbus or South Bend or Ann Arbor or wherever. Uh, the first newsletter of the Michigan State Railroad Club probably thought that it would take them three or four years and they'd have the locomotive running. Hmm. It took 18, but they did hmm. succeed in getting it running again, and it still runs today. And some of those founding members are still part of our group and even very active in, in on our board of directors for the last... Um, uh, what's it been now? Uh, close to close to coming up on 50 years, uh, I think, next fall. Um, so the MSU Railroad Club is, it, they've been fully spun off. There's no relationship with MSU anymore. It's, we're an independent group, the Steam Learning Institute and Michigan State Trust for Railway Preservation became an independent group. And in 2004, we were fortunate enough to serve as technical advisors for the Polar Express Museum. Uh, people ask how that occurred. How did we wind up being the, the, the model or being the animation source for the Polar Express? And I've got some video clips coming up here next that we'll, we'll go through. Uh, basically, you know, a lot of it being at the right place at the right time. We had an executive director on staff at that point. Dennis Gray uh, was our uh, was our executive director. He was in the office one day and took a phone call. Literally took a phone call out of the blue. Uh, from uh, Lucas Sound or Skywalker Sound and the people who were working on the locomotive who said, uh, we hear you have a steam locomotive. Yes, we have steam locomotive. Well, we've called the Smithsonian, we've called the Henry Ford Museum. We're looking for one that operates. That's how a locomotive operates. You have video that you could, recent video, yes, we have video. You have all the blueprints and drawings that we can use to help us with our drawings and sketches. Turns out we do. We happen to have an almost complete set of blueprints that were salvaged uh, from the dumpster, literally as they were being thrown out at the shops in Grand Rapids area. And so we basically had everything that they uh, uh, could want. And so we became the technical advisor. If you wait till the very, very end of the credits in the movie, you'll see the Steam Railroading Institute listed as the locomotive advisor for the movie. The sound was recorded here in Michigan. All the railroad sounds, including uh, you know the whistle, the bell, or the sound of uh, uh, the air compressors, and all the different noises that the train makes when it starts or stops, was all recorded over a couple of day period up uh, near Owasso and some of our branch line track up to Henderson and Owasso, uh, including the sound that the kids make sliding down the coal pile. That's one of our firemen that uh, breaks <laughs> from uh, from Windsor, Ontario. Uh, they had a whole list of sound effects. They said, what would it sound like if a couple small kids fell down a coal pile? And they kind of looked at each other and said, well, we don't really know, but we can send one of our firemen up to the top of the pile and find out. And so they recorded him yeah, sliding down the coal pile. A uh, little hit before I get back into the Polar Express stories, a little uh, you know, history. Uh, a pretty small office in the student union and working outside, one of the early uh, student volunteers starting to work on the locomotive, out in the elements, outside, just around a, uh, her, a, a cyclone fence, or just around a, a basic chicken wire fence. Uh, on average, we've had maybe 400 to 600 museum members through the year, uh, per year. And there's been 
about 3,000, I think, the best recollection we can figure, who come through the organization at different times. And probably only 20 or 30 active people really working on the locomotive at any given time. We're a little higher than that now. Uh, and we have uh, an equal number of more car hosts doing uh, some of our, our car host duties with our trips. But as far as people you know, maintaining the locomotive, not really a whole lot. Uh, but um, you can get a lot done with uh, consistent long-term effort um, and 20% uh, you know, of your organization kind of keeps plugging away at it, you can make uh, some pretty good progress. Mm -hmm. um, this is a photo of uh, those early days as they got started on the locomotive. You can see, you know, it was just, it was just out, out, in the, out in the lawn uh, there outside the stadium and the power plant. Um, first fire up, you know, we did find, we do have a video. Let's we'll see if we can get this to work here. So it did not move, but they were successful. After about six years of work, they were successful building up steam and blowing the whistle. The Michigan State University Railroad Club fired up Para Marquette Berkshire number 1225 on the MSU campus. This was the culmination of six years of work. The 1225 had not known steam for 22 years. After all this silence, it was good to hear her speak again. After so many years as a silent showpiece, the cab was once more the center of activity. The restoration is well along towards the day when cracking this throttle will set her 400 tons in motion again. So keep in mind that was a Sunday morning, apparently about 10 o'clock on a college campus in uh, the fall of 1975. Uh, apparently we did not recruit very many new members that day from the uh, campus organization. The adjoining dorms were not impressed. But for the people working on the locomotive, it was a, it was a pretty good day. So, so all right. so. In 2004, as I said, so in 2004, uh, the movie comes out. Uh, we've run holiday trips as we have most railroad museums in the country since then, uh, between the holiday trains and the uh, Thomas the Tank Engine events. That's what really keeps railroad preservation efforts alive these days. The movie changed our operating plan considerably. Wintertime, we never used to run. And this year we'll be doing 22 trips uh, between Thanksgiving, or week before Thanksgiving and Christmas, um, and uh, 22 trips and calling out, or about almost 20,000, roughly 20,000 people will have come visit the Lasso and uh, where we go. So, uh, so view uh, traveling through the, uh, the snowy countryside on the way up to the village for a country Christmas celebration. Um, one of our one of our younger members, uh, George Dines and, and Luke Iverson, work with our social media, and, and they've uh, spliced together a few videos uh, that compare our real operation with what the movie crew animated and what they uh, did. So let me uh, try to get a few more of these video clips going. Uh, first, we'll hear uh, from one of our founding members and a current board president, Arnie Froboom, talking about this was a news. Uh... Enjoyment comes from showing people who weren't even born when this engine was working what it was like years ago. We, uh, we have the ability now here to 
recreate the past. And it was just nine years ago when the world-famous director George Lucas called up the Steam Railroad Institute and asked to make Train 1225 the biggest star of them all. The film crew mimicked every detail from the locomotive, even the train's very own engineer, Kevin Mayer. We spent about two days recording all the sounds to uh, a squeaky wheel on a car to one of our volunteers sliding down the coal pile. And we'll do a couple of these comparisons. Uh, so here you'll get an idea of... Of detail into that animation uh, that they got uh, from our videos and drawings. And then the last one I'll try to show here. Okay, so, you know, as I said, you can see how, uh, what, what lengths they went to animate uh, very accurately for uh, the drawings and, and the sound recordings uh, from the locomotive. So we hope you see those comparisons. The next time you watch the Polar Express movie this, uh, this month, uh, you know, have in mind that a lot of that came from right here in Michigan. So, all right, so uh, one of the other questions we get a lot is how do you keep something that was built 75, 78 years ago, uh, operating uh, in the, the 21st century. What does it take to do this? Because a lot of the infrastructure, the water towers, the coaling towers, the roundhouses that employed a couple hundred boilermakers, they're not around anymore. So how do you do this? Well, that's the, uh, it, interestingly enough, there are still federal regulations that govern steam locomotives. We're inspected every year by a man from the Federal Railway Administration. Uh, now he has other duties in the region. I mean, he's out with the, uh, the current railroads as well. But they're familiar with all the steam rules and regulations. They check our boiler tests and, and a number of other things that they do. And every 15 years, you need to take the engine apart and do an inspection and replace the tubes and flues. Um, this is normal maintenance from back in the 1930s and 40s, uh, but it's a big deal for us nowadays at a museum. And our last inspection, uh, our, our downtime period, was from 2009 to 2013. It took us about four years to complete the process, which is actually fairly, fairly quick for a, a, a volunteer or tourist railroad type museum. Um, and this time we did more than just the tube, we did the hook firebox. And so at this point, I used my little prop that I carry with me. It's not just a water bottle, it's a steam locomotive boiler, okay? So this is basically the way a steam locomotive works, if you're not familiar. Uh, the round part of the boiler is, in fact, filled up with water, about three quarters water, and the steam builds up at the top. If I took my thumb and just made a big indentation back here at the back, I would be essentially building the firebox. That's where we build the coal fire. 
Uh, the floor of the, that area is open to the air. There are grates that move, and we throw the coal on top of those grates. And you can see if I push further in, I have a big indentation, and I have an inner firebox sheet and an outer wall sheet. The inner firebox sheet is where all the heat transfer, where all the work goes, and that metal gets you know, stressed out. And after 75 years, after, well, after 65 years since the last major outshopping, it was ready to be fully, completely replaced. So in addition to that firebox area, passing through the boiler are 240 flues and tubes, a couple different sizes. Nominally, I think it's three, three and a half inches, I think, uh, uh, are the, the larger pipes. And all those have to come out. Uh, then the boiler shell is inspected 100% all the way around. You have to be able to see uh, the boiler shell and take a visual and thickness measurement with ultrasound uh, thickness equipment. So to do all that, uh, we start tearing the locomotive apart. And the smoke box door comes open. Those tubes and flues you see uh, up in there uh, start coming out of the, the boiler. Uh, the cab, this time, because of the major rebuild, the, the cab came off the engine, the sand dome, we had parts scattered all around the, the shop and the yard. This is a view inside the boiler. This is where that firebox would be. You see these uh, stay bolts support the top of the, the, the sheet or of that box area that I, I demonstrated. And then there's a, a new piece of metal that's forming the inner sheet over here. And we've got some also some stables that are going out to the outer shell. And that holds the firebox area up. Um, uh, fabricating the new sheets, uh, we have some tools. We also have, there's other steam operators that have additional tools. This, I believe, was at the Strasburg Railroad in Pennsylvania. Um, there were a few other shops that helped us out with different uh, parts and the forming the sheet, the metal that was going to go in to the new firebox or into the boiler. There are a few, there are some hot rivets. There are some riveting done uh, along the lower uh, shell. You see a couple of our volunteers here. Uh, Fred Stevens is inside the boiler shell. I'm not sure who's holding the rivet gun and the rivet outside. They're getting ready to pound that red hot or white hot rivet. Um, down and then when it cools, it keeps the inner outer sheets together around the lower ring, around the mud ring. New tubes then can go in. So you start uh, cutting and uh, lifting and guiding those in and then uh, all of the weld, any welding that's done or any of the welding that's done is not volunteer. We do use boiler, uh, a lot of times Purvis and Foster from here in town that do marine and stationary boilers. They, come up uh, a lot of times. They're the contractor we use to do the certified welding on the pressure vessel because you do need uh, some special certification and training to do a, uh, a pressurized vessel. Uh, machine shop, we drill out holes in all those stay bolts so that we can detect the leak or if one is broken. That, that we do in our own shop. So then everybody eventually will ask, well, my goodness, how much does all of this cost? Mm -hmm. it costs quite a bit. Uh, this last rebuild we did was close to $900,000, roughly. Uh, remember I said the locomotive was worth $250,000 in 1941 when it was built, or $2.5 today. This was, you know, 30% of a 40% of a, of a, of a, of a, of a brand-new uh, diesel locomotive. Uh, we were fortunate enough to get a batching grant from the state. We got about a third, about, about a third of the price was paid through transportation department funds. They are required, uh, a certain percentage of our highway taxes go to um, streetscapes and uh, downtown lighting and museum projects, historic preservation. And so uh, we, we qualified for that. We're very fortunate uh, to do that. That is... It is a, a law that I think it's 1% or a little less than 1% has to go to such projects. We applied, we had some questions, we called the office up in Lansing that, that, that does this, and apparently the gentlemen there normally get street sidewalks, streetscapes, and landscaping. 
and we explained what we were doing, and we said we had a 400-ton 1941 steam locomotive that we'd like to rebuild, and said the line got very quiet, and said, you have a what? And uh, as we talked more, he got a little more excited about it and thought, well, this will be different than just, you know, putting brick pavers down in the, the middle of downtown somewhere. So they, they seemed pretty happy with, uh, with the work that we did. And it's been very successful. The locomotive has been operating since 2013 and uh, getting a pretty uh, nice addition to the Owasso area. Uh, there are other grant organizations. There are historic preservation grants from uh, different uh, companies, and we did a donation campaign. And the rest came from unrestricted. If you've ever ridden one of our trips, if you've uh, bought a ticket, you know, or come to see us at the museum, um, uh, you know, the remaining funds came from that. So, yeah, so it is an expensive job, but uh, it's doable. You know, you can, uh, you, you, can, you can do it. So I covered a little bit of the history, both of our locomotive, the local history here in, Mich or here in Rochester. Uh, what exists of all these different railroads that we've talked about today? Well, as I said, the CSX lines that go between Detroit and Grand Rapids and from uh, Saginaw down to Toledo still exist. Those are old Per Marquette railroad tracks. Round here in Rochester, uh, you can still ride the route of the Timberliner, but you'll have to bring your bicycle. That is now the Paint Creek Trail uh, leading out of town. And Paint Creek was the first rail trail in Michigan, as I understand it, you know, from the website. Um, so it was one of the first preservation movements as the bankrupt railroads and, and lack of industry caused the, the tracks to be torn up. Uh, the Paint Creek air Trail was one of the first ones that was converted into a, a bike and hiking uh, walking path. Uh, also, the depot. Again, as I understand, it still exists here in town. Stop by the Catching Fireflies gift gallery. Uh, a couple different views of it through the years. It, well, it still looks like it did in one of those early photographs that I used earlier in the presentation. And that's their, uh, that's their current website uh, photo. Uh, oops, hit the wrong button again. Uh, that's their current uh, photo, uh, the 200 block of University, I believe it is. Uh, the car ferries, uh, the SS Badger still operates. One of the last Paramarquette or last Chesapeake and Ohio car ferries is still in operation. Does not haul railroad equipment. It hauls um, uh, cars now. Uh, this was a photo of their first trip from Milwaukee back over to Ludington carrying a shipload of Nash automobiles. Uh, it could uh, haul about 33 freight cars, and now it hauls uh, once or twice a day across Lake Michigan uh, with uh, automobiles and trucks. Truck, a lot of the uh, semi-trucks kind of like taking that again so that they don't have to drive through where? Chicago. Chicago, right, yeah. So if you're headed up into the Pacific Northwest or Minnesota, Think about uh, taking a shortcut on the SS Badger during the summer. Um, uh, SS Badger, ssbadger.com, I believe, is their, their website. And that's a picture of them leaving, leaving Ludington. Uh, right here, closer to home uh, for the next few weekends, over at the Van Hoosen Museum, the Stony Creek Model Railroad Club will be set up, and you can see a variety of scenes uh, both from around the area and uh, other you know, fanciful scenes from around the country that have been developed by model railroaders. Open to the public 12 to 3 p.m. on Saturdays and Sundays, and then the week in between Christmas and New Year's, the 26th to the 29th. So stop on over at the Van Hoosen uh, farm and the, uh, the display barn there. So we finish up with a couple notes about why on earth do we do this? And I guarantee you when it's 10 degrees above zero and you're digging nine inches of snow out of a switch, as one of our engineers, Charlie Kreicher, is doing right there along with another volunteer, you'll probably ask yourself that. Why, why are we doing this? Well, we think it's important to give uh, the younger generations a, a feel for history, what history was like. Uh, 60, 75, 100 years ago really is not that long ago or not that far back in human history. And think about how different the world was when you could 
take a steam train from Rochester and then go up to Mackinac City or Detroit or anywhere else you wanted to go in the country. A lot of times we have riders, we have passengers on our different trips um, who say, you know, I've never been on a train before. We're, we're their introduction to rail travel. And then we can tell them a little bit about, well, there is still rail travel here in the state. You can go to Chicago from, uh, from Birmingham, Detroit, or Pontiac, or Dearborn. Um, uh, there's more and more uh, local rail traffic being built up on the eastern seaboard and out in California and around Chicago all the time. So who knows, maybe it's coming back a little bit. So it's a touch to the past and it's uh, an interpretation of what, how the country or how, how we are today in living in areas that we currently live in that would have been uninhabitable 200 years ago. We think that the best way to understand the experience history is to hear it, see it, and feel it. Static displays are wonderful. Static displays are great, but there's nothing like seeing an old piece of railroad equipment or a locomotive in operation. Uh, we're very fortunate. We have a, a nice mixture of, uh, of uh, uh, experienced uh, adults and uh, youth. In our group right now, we have a we have a good mix of younger folks, as well as some of the, the older hands that are, are working on the locomotive, and it's good for that mix to be working together and, and, and talking about you know, preserving these skills and also giving the younger folks something uh, you know productive and entertaining and interesting for them to do. You know, it's a better than a better than a video game, right? You know, if you can get the some uh, some of the younger uh, guys out there shoveling coal and ashes. Uh, that, that's that's good for us as a as a society to, to get some mechanical skills. We've been uh, very uh, fortunate. We've had quite a few members originally when the group was first formed. It was a group of students and retired railroad people. We've had a reasonable number. I think I kind of I think it's eight somewhere between eight and ten of people members who started with us that then went on to a career in the railroad. Uh, later on, and maybe they wouldn't have been introduced to that. Maybe they wouldn't have understood that it's a it's a good job, it's a good career. Uh, it can support you for a long uh, time in a, a pretty decent manner. So, uh, economic benefits for the region. In two thousand nine, uh, we scheduled a, a major collection of steam locomotives. It was a big steam event. It's called Train Festival two thousand nine. Working with a, another a promoter from Ohio. Uh, we brought 36,000 people in mid-Michigan from all 50 states, 14 other countries, right at the height of the, big, of the Great Recession. So uh, the area really, I think, prospered and benefited uh, there in mid-Michigan when we hosted that event. Um, we did another one in 2014. Um, uh, no, no similar festivals or fairs are, are planned right now, but... Our normal schedule, as I said, we're bringing 20,000 people up to Owasso um, this uh, month for North Pole trips, and then we do some fall color tours and other things. So it can be an economic driver or uh, add a little bit to the local economy. Um, other news around SRI, we were fortunate enough in 2014 to win the Governor's Award for Historic Preservation, kind of a a tribute to all those uh, crazy students that have been uh, with us from the MSU days and uh, all the, the thousands of volunteers who have been uh, members of our group since then. It was a nice, uh, nice recognition uh, from the State Historic Preservation Office. Uh, we celebrated 1225 75th birthday. This was an excursion trip we took up to Clare, Michigan. Uh, that photo, you know, when I say it takes a lot of volunteers to run the train and how many people are working on it, all those folks that you see uh, there posing in front of the engine are uh, mechanical volunteers, car host volunteers, tour guides, museum uh, workers, our staff, uh, members of the Institute. Um, it's, a, it's an ever-growing group and um, we'd love to have you come up and visit us sometime. Our next project, we've acquired a smaller locomotive. This is a little, uh, a little brother, if you will, to uh, 1225. Uh, it's older. It's actually, uh, maybe, maybe we should call it Big Brother. I don't know. It's, it's older. It's uh, 33 years older than 1225 is. It was built in 1908 by American Locomotive. And it operated for the Chicago Northwestern system up into the Upper Peninsula, up around Escanaba. 
and we'll start rebuilding it uh, soon. We'll be working on it next year. Um, and our schedule, as I said, uh, starting every year, roughly Memorial Day, uh, we start different operations. We have some hands on the throttle events. If you've ever wanted to pull the throttle of a steam locomotive, we offer that occasionally. Uh, we did a uh, historic tractors and trains event in July. Uh, we run with the Howell Mellon Festival. So you'll see us around uh, the southeast part of the state. And then, of course, those North Pole Express trips from November 16th to December 22nd. There's a few books out about the 1225 if you're interested in more. I will uh, leave one of them with the library. I'll donate that one. Um, I was fortunate enough to be uh, one of the authors of that book. Uh, the bigger book, 1225 by Kevin Keith, a noted railroad historian and author. I have a few samples there on the back, um, uh, the back uh, table if you're interested in learning even more. And we're always interested in having folks volunteer. So if you're interested, come on up and see us. And I think that was it. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. <laughs> Uh, North Pole trips, we're currently with a power car, and, uh, uh, and we have three producers and 12 uh, passenger cars, a merchandise car, a power car, so I think the train's 15, I believe the train's 15 cars. Uh, 900, roughly 900. One trip. No, one trip. Yeah. Yeah. And the village, and the village works in, in Santa's village is a town of about 500 people. So we double, we, uh, we triple, we double up their size uh, when we, every time we arrive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, back in the day, it, it, it has pulled as many as 30 passenger cars on an excursion trip in 1991. And back in the day, it could haul 80, 78, 80 to 90 freight cars at 60 miles an hour across the state of Michigan. Well, where do you get the cars? We do. We own. Uh, we we own. We own the caboose. We own three cabooses. We own uh, one, two, three, four passenger cars now. We borrow one from the rail. The, our post railroad, Great Lakes Central. They own a passenger car. We get a couple of cars from them. There are other car leasing organizations. Uh, five of our cars are the uh, double decker uh, uh, cars that were purchased by the state for commuter service that has not yet. Uh, Materialized, but we lease, the, <laughs> but we lease them every year for our North Pole trip right now. So five of those cars in the current list are those double decker stadiums. There's other sources around that you can you can lease from, but we're so we're pretty we're pretty independent, especially with the fall Pole trips. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, there, well, there's a few preservation efforts going on right now with uh, locomotives that were in park displays for a long time, like our Chicago Northwestern 175. There have been a few overseas uh, that were rebuilt from scratch. Um, and one smaller one here uh, in Illinois, a, a gentleman in Illinois rebuilt a Civil War type of locomotive, a 440 locomotive. He built that one from scratch. So it is it is possible to build a boiler from scratch and, and all the rest of the run do it. Doesn't happen often, but it, it can. <coughs> Given the fact that Michigan is known for having the longest water main in the country, is there any reason why you can't make a Yes. Do you have to soften it anymore? We do. We do. Uh, we do we'll add water treatment. We add water treatment directly to the tender. We'd love to have a softening system right there on the site, you know, also, but we don't have that yet. Water softening was a big deal. Uh, water treatment and conditioning was a big deal for the railroads. All those water towers generally had uh, uh, softening equipment that would treat the water before it went up into the tower. Uh, they, they would do all sorts of analysis, and a lot of development in water treatment and water softening occurred because the railroads needed it. Well, how do they soften water compared to what they do today? 
Um, that I'm not sure. I, it, I'm not an expert. I, I know that we, we get certain chemicals for water, either liquid or powder. Most of our stuff right now is liquid. We have used powders in the past. We'll take measurements on the solids and the different chemicals or the different minerals that are in the water and then add the chemicals to keep the particle either in suspension or to get it to fall out and, and then blow down or to get the, to get the particulates out of the water. Um, how it happened in the past, I, I've seen, I mean, I've seen photos of the, the water treatment sheds with, with bags of the same chemicals we use. But, but yeah. have they always treated the water from the beginning inception of the engine? Probably, well, no, not the, not the real early one, not the real, real early ones wouldn't know. They, you know, as they started dealing with corrosion, they would have started doing more experiments and, and looking at different ways to treat it, and that's where some of those water treatment chemicals and processes that we use you know, started from. But yeah, they wouldn't, yeah, back in the day, back in the day they just, uh, you know, drew water in from the local creek or the pond or whatever they had in the 1830s and 40s. They wouldn't have been, they wouldn't have had a lot of equipment to do with water treatment. But it, it, is, a, it is a big deal now. Yeah, yeah we, we'd love to have a, a tank and be able to treat it. Or so we just dump it into the tender and hope that as we're filling it, it mixes it up good enough, you know, and hope that the water move motion with it in the next. No. Uh, no, they went in Greenfield Village. So they were, uh, that was, that's also Chesapeake and Ohio engine. But that's actually bigger than ours. Uh, we have eight sets, we have eight driving wheels with four axles. That one at the village, uh, that has uh, uh, 12, six axles. That has two more axles than we do. It's an articulated locomotive. It's about, I think it's 20 feet longer than our locomotive. 10 or 20 feet longer. It's one of the, it's, it's one of the biggest ones. But there were some that were slightly, there were some that were even a little bit bigger. Out west, the Union Pacific Grand Sun are even bigger. But the one at Greenfield Village is even a little bit larger than other ones. That, that one at the village did not operate in Michigan. That was a uh, Chesapeake and Ohio Hawking Valley. It ran to Toledo, the coal docks at Toledo up from West Virginia. I don't believe it ever came up into Michigan other than to go on display. Yeah. Last Friday night, I was fortunate enough to take the grandkids on the trip. Oh! Um, it was pulled up by the uh, 1225, mm -hmm. but on the return trip, I could tell by the form and yeah. the speed, quite frankly, it was pulled by these. We have a diesel on the back, yeah. Is, is that yours and you run it? Uh, we we, uh, we uh, lease that from the Great Lake Central Railroad. We have our crew, uh, sometimes we have a Great Lake Central crew, sometimes it's one of our people. Uh, I'm not sure who, I don't remember who was running on Friday. But there's no place to turn the locomotive up at the building. I, I was, I was going to ask that. Yeah, question. we can't turn the train. How far does the train have to go before it can turn uh, There's a Y in Alma and uh, one up in Cadillac. We have a turntable in Owasso. So we can turn ourselves, but the issue is uh, other places to turn along the route. And where we stop for the, for the Santa's Village, it's not, uh, there's no place to turn. Yeah, so we just do we just do push pull. Twelve twenty five goes north, and then the diesel pulls it back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did that same. Yeah, we did that same little road with Chesney. Yeah. Speedway, yeah. Speedway, yeah. Speedway, and sometimes we're in a sometimes we're in a hurry to get home. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, we'll start, uh, so our first trips are um, uh, Friday night at 6 p.m. We'll start the process overnight on uh, Thursday night, somewhere between midnight and 3 a.m. We'll light the fire off. Um, it, it, it's, you can do it about, it's about an eight-hour process to bring it up nice and slow. And then there's... You have to do some testing of the safety appliances, and then the whole routine you have to go through to check everything out for that weekend or for that trip. It depends on how long it's been since it ran last. Um, we'll, eight to 12 hours is, is about what we'll take to do. Yeah. 
Yes, yes, we do. Uh, out on the, now, out on the road, we have a so we have a soaker motor. Uh, we we do have an auger that feeds coal in automatically. Firemen can use. But when we're just sitting in the yard, or overnight, when we're just tending the fire in between uh, Saturday and Sunday trips, there'll be a crew on board, and we hand fire or use the soaker. But yeah, you can still fill coal in. I mean, yeah. 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 And after 20 years, I still can't hit the front corner of the fire. <laughs> I, I do that once in a while. I, mean, I, I, I do some of the night watch tending sometimes. It's interesting. It's an interesting balance to try to keep everything, you know, the fire burning and the steam and pressure on. It's, uh, it's, uh, there's no automatic control. Right? You just have to monitor everything and do it yourself. Yeah. I got there early enough to, to see it on the side. And before it started to move, it got off a tremendous amount of steam. Mm -hmm. It seems like it needed that steam to move. Why did it release all that? So, so if it was coming, so if it was, if the steam exhaust that you saw was coming from the lower portion of the mm -hmm. cylinders, uh, we opened up some valves, cylinder tops there, to, to blow out wet heat, water, or condensation. You can compress and expand steam. It's very difficult to do that with liquid water. And you can really damage things if there's too much liquid water in it. So the engineer opens up those cylinder tops to let that exhaust out until we're convinced that there's no more water, you know, in there. And then he closes it off and it gets it gets quieter again, right? You know, it, all that escaping steam stops and then it's only going out the stack. Um, yeah, that, that's just to get that's just to get all everything working and make sure that there's no water in the same. Yes, yes, yes. It's a, it's, a, it's a good show. Yeah. What's the difference between um, the black smoke and the white smoke? Black smoke and white smoke. Okay, so um, uh, white smoke is strictly is just steam. That's just the steam exhaust. When that steam that was uh, up into the top of the boiler is released. The engineer opens the valves, release it down into the cylinders, and removing the rods. After that steam does its work, it goes back out the stack. If we have a nice, crisp, clean fire going, all you'll see is white steam coming out. That's just steam exhaust. If it's black smoke, it's one of the rookie firemen like me who's <laughs> put a little too much coal in there and we're not burning quite as clean or hot as we should be. And uh, you know we have signs in the obvious of black smoke and bad. You know and we try to try to keep it clean. Then sometimes you do it for photography. But yeah, I, I had heard yeah. it was sometimes yeah. it's for show. Yeah. yeah. When you come sometimes into town, nowadays, you want all the white steam. Sometimes so. nowadays the black smoke is. Yeah. You try. You try. If firemen in the old days, firemen would you know pride themselves on a right. real clean. You. There are shots in the summer if it's a dry. There's shots where you can hardly even tell if there's any exhaust at all. It's so it's such a clean fire and balance. And how, how um, the engineer that does the fire engineer that does the signal when he comes to intersections? Mm -hmm. How do they come up with their own song? Because it's like everybody's got their own tune. I mean, uh, it has to have some aspects, but... Yes and no. Actually, they're all blowing the same pattern. That, that whistle is actually talking to the crew um, and other people and people uh, and, and the public. Uh, today, the diesels use the same two, two long blasts, a short and a long. That's a grade crossing. You're approaching a grade crossing. We get two long blasts on the whistle, one short one, one long one. Uh, one long blast, we've stopped and the engine's secure, and we can get off the train. Two, we're going forward. Three short, we're going to back up. They had a whole pattern. It was almost like Morse. It was, it was a lot like Morse code, really, uh, because in the old days before radios, somebody in the caboose or elsewhere uh, in the train, they could be half a mile, almost a mile away. You know? And so to communicate with the lo what the locomotive was doing, they had whistle <coughs> signals that they used, and those are still in use today. So what you're hearing is it's really the same pattern. Now maybe the guy blowing the whistle is a little shorter or a little longer than somebody else, but they're using the same uh, pattern of whistles, or whistles, whistle signals. Yeah. 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 What did they uh, haul during the war? 
What did they haul during the war? Okay, so uh, 1225 and the Berkshire, the, the 1200 series engines were always freight engines. We never found any record that they hauled passengers. They were actually too heavy to enter the Detroit or Chicago depots. Uh, they hauled uh, all, of, all the war material, um, uh, outbound automobiles, jeeps, tanks, hack tracks, whatever was made in the uh, aircraft guns, you know, whatever. Uh, that were uh, leaving Michigan. Uh, they hauled uh, coal, they hauled a lot of oil. Um, because, uh, oil from the Texas out to the East Coast because the shipping and the, the German submarines were interfering with the tanker traffic. So all of a sudden, a lot of that oil commodity came on the rails to get safely to the East Coast refineries. Um, they all, uh, you know, the raw, the, the steel, and the, all the raw materials that went into it. Uh, refrigerated freight. The Michigan Central made a lot of money hauling refrigerated freight to the East Coast. They used the Michigan line a lot for that, coming out of Chicago with perishable from California and out west. Uh, they take a shortcut. Uh, they use this route a lot to get out into Buffalo and New York City, so they would run refrigerator trains through Michigan. Uh, and then there were other locomotives that were hauling the troops uh, out you know, to the various ports for them to be over to the buildings. After that, it was auto part. You know, it was auto parts, a lot of furniture out of Grand Rapids, uh, you know, uh, any machine parts you could. Um, you know, canned goods. Every town had a little sighting. The grocery store could order a box car of uh, you know various canned and box products, cereal from you know Battle Creek or wherever. And the railroad would just park the box car there, and they'd come get. Yeah, yeah. It was a pretty wide, wide mix of. Uh, yes, sir. We're going to find out about the uh, tour. You know, the the tours you have. Ah, yes. Okay. A good lead-in to our website, MichiganSteamTrain.com. Uh, all one word, MichiganSteamTrain.com. We'll have our uh, our our up-to-date schedule uh, for next. Usually in the spring. We post the annual uh, schedule uh, for uh, 2019. Uh, we'll be winding down in a few weeks here uh, this year. We'll uh, be wrapping up our, our current series of holiday trains and then uh, figure out what the schedule's like uh, for next year. But MichiganSteamTrain.com. <laughs>